Hey, I just want to start by saying thank you to our church for just an awesome response to last week's message. We started this sermon series, Reaching for Jesus Plus One, because it is our mission and the vision for everything that we do as a church family. Reaching for Jesus Plus One, it simply means this, that we are pursuing Christ with everything we've got, and we are guiding others along in that journey. We want more people to join in. Like, that's the goal, isn't it? And we talked last week about kind of the state of where we are right now as a church. We saw some really encouraging numbers, like attendance is up. We've had some baptisms this year, and and we are moving in that direction. And, And knowing where we are, we are able to set some goals for ourselves going forward. You guys... Do you remember the goals that we set last week? I hope you do. Everybody everybody put up your fist like this. Put a fist up in the air. We're going to start with number one. Put out your pointer finger. Number one. Goal number one. Everybody say 300. 300. 300. We want to see 300 people in this service on a Sunday morning before the end of 2024. 300 people. If you remember, I told you last week we have 276 active members of our church. That's what our database says, active members. And so if everybody just showed up all at once, we'd only be 24 people away. 2026. All right, give me your peace signs. Goal number two. Let me see them. Peace, everybody. Goal number two. Everybody say 11. 11. $11. That's all it takes. Last week we looked that our offerings over the summertime months have increased slightly And they've been consistent across the board, yet we are still not quite meeting our monthly financial budgetary needs. And so our goal is that we would hit our yearly budgetary needs, not our spending budget, but our needs. Your giving is what we're talking about. And so in order to hit that goal of meeting budget by the end of this year, it requires every active member of Crosspoint to increase their giving by $11 between now and the end of the year. $11 is all it takes for us to hit that goal. Goal number three, show me your best Steph Curry impersonations. Three's in the air. Goal number three, everybody say 13. 13. 13. Lucky number 13. We want to see 13 more baptisms at least this year, 13 more people saying yes to Jesus and going all in. You know, last year we had 30 baptisms total for the year of 2023. This year we've had 19 so far and just a little over halfway to go or a little under halfway to go, 17 is our goal to meet last year, but also because we are growing as a church. There are more people in the seats on Sunday mornings now than there were a year ago, which means there are more people who are ready to go all in with Jesus. And that is the mission, after all, that we would transform, help people see who Jesus is so that they could experience transformation for both right now and all of their eternity. Those are our three goals until the end of the year, and I hope that you'll take those to heart because it takes all of us to accomplish those goals. I mean, remember, church isn't all about the numbers, right? Church isn't all about the numbers, but the numbers tell us something very important. Are we living on mission or are we failing at our mission? That's it. Our mission is to seek and save the lost. It's to love Jesus with everything we've got and guide others to join in that journey. That's why we set goals for ourselves. Not just the motivation, because Jesus is enough motivation for us. He should be anyway. He died on the cross for your sins, and he was resurrected from the grave, and he's alive at the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. That should be enough motivation for you. But every now and then, it's good as a church family to have some metrics, some guiding posts that we are aiming for as a group. And so our goal is to live on mission. This morning, I'm so thankful that we already heard from two groups who are living on mission. We just heard from Bread. Man, isn't it awesome what they're doing at the different college campuses in Kennesaw, Emory, and Oxford? Give them another round of applause. They're living on mission. And their mission is to seek one person at a time on their college campuses. And then we heard our community meditation from David Grimm. That's my uncle. That's Joni's son, if you didn't know that. And, and, yeah, 
great, it's Joni's son. That's awesome, right? Okay, cool. But he's doing ministry. He's doing ministry right where he is in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He goes out and preaches at the homeless ministry. He and a group of other people. And they go out on Sundays and they preach. And you heard his story this morning about the one who needed to know about Jesus. That's the mission. And if you're going to be a person who lives on mission, you've got to adopt some characteristics in your life. And this morning we're going to look in the book of Acts, chapter 1, and we're going to see some, some do's and don'ts about living on mission. So open up your Bibles to Acts, chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verses 6 through 8. We're going to be here for quite some time this morning. Just give it a moment. My clicker will start. Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. This is, in this passage, this is Jesus' last chance on earth with his followers. This is his last face-to-face -face moment with his disciples and the other followers before he goes back to heaven. Because everything he came to do is now complete. It's done. His ministry is complete. He, he did so many miraculous wonders and signs, and he introduced the kingdom of heaven on earth, and he trained up this group of 12 disciples who, who would go out and make more disciples, and not to mention those 12. He also had hundreds of other followers who went from, with him from place to place to place, and now Jesus was ready to go back to heaven. He had been falsely accused by the leaders. He had been wrongfully arrested and put on trial. He was crucified on the cross for your sin. And three days later, he was resurrected from the grave and is alive today. The ministry was done. The work was finished. And now Jesus was going to go back to heaven to be with his Father God. Have you ever had that feeling, this overwhelming feeling that you needed to say one more thing to that loved one that you were about to say goodbye to? It's that overwhelming feeling inside of you as you walked somebody out to the car before they drove away from your house. There's just one more thing I need to say. Or that one more thing is you dropped somebody off at the airport before they took a long trip. I just need one. I got to say one more thing. Or, or when you hang up the telephone and you know it's going to be a long time before you speak to that person again, just one more thing. Or as you walk out of the hospital room and you have that feeling, that might be the last chance you get to say one more thing. And usually the last thing you say in that scenario is the most important thing you could say to that person. And Jesus is about to go back to heaven, leave his followers on the earth, and he's going to give them the most important thing they could hear before he leaves. In Acts chapter 1, let's, let's go back two verses to verse 4. This was the time before he left. So this is the penultimate thing that he's going to say to his followers. He says in verse 4, he says, On one occasion, he was eating with his disciples, and he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father has promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I told you this before. And the book of John outlines it beautifully in, verses four, in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Like Jesus has to go away so that God can send the Holy Spirit to be with all believers. Jesus says, don't worry, that spirit is coming to you. This is the Holy Spirit. He is the, the helper. He is the counselor. He is the advocate. He is the teacher of truth. That Holy Spirit is going to remind you all the things that I have already taught to you. This spirit is going to come and dwell within you. And you would think that at this moment, the disciples would jump out of their seats. Finally, this Holy Spirit is going to come be inside of us. It's going to change the way we live and how we think and how we act and how we relate to other people. But instead of being excited, they kind of swept this news to the side. The disciples, instead of jumping for joy at the prospect of the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, they, they were fixated on on a different future for themselves. The disciples were suffering from what I'm calling impatient anticipation. Impatient anticipation. We all know what that's like, don't we? I mean, my goodness, we know what impatient anticipation is like. Everything changed for you and I 
in 2005. You remember what happened in 2005? That's the year that Amazon as a company went from being an online bookstore to being an online everything store. And Amazon changed the game because in 2005, for the low price of $79.99 per year, you could be a member of Amazon Prime, which meant you had access to the full catalog and free two-day shipping. Woo-hoo! You could have everything you wanted faster than you ever knew you needed it. Wow. We have been conditioned to be people of impatient anticipation. When Amazon launched their Amazon mobile app, now you could order it in the palm of your hand and track the shipping with just a tap, and it made it feel like the package would get here faster than two days, but it was still on its way. And then with newer technology, now you can see the map. And in real time, you can see where your delivery truck is in relation to where you are, and it'll alert you that you're 10 stops away, and now you're four stops away, and now you're two stops away, and you're next. Oh, oh, we, we, my goodness, we have been conditioned to always want what is next. We... We get so distracted by what is next, this impatient anticipation of what could be next. The disciples, even though they had just heard that the Holy Spirit was going to come and live inside them, in verse 6, they gathered around Jesus and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Yeah, 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 the Holy Spirit, you told us about that. But but like, is this the point in time when you're going to, restore our nation? Are you going to turn our country into a great place again, Jesus? See, we can learn a valuable lesson from the disciples here, that if we're going to be people who live on mission, we have to be present right where we are. You've got to be present. Man, I have had to work on this in my life. I have had to really think about being present right where I am, especially in conversation. I, I, my, my mind tends to drift in conversation. It's not because you're boring, I promise. It's because my mind is thinking about what's coming up next. And so uh, sometimes, like when, I, when I'm in conversation with people after church on Sunday, I'll have to stop myself I- and try and discipline my brain because in the middle of a conversation, I'll be thinking about what to say next to keep the conversation going, and then I zone out from what the person is saying to me. Or I'll get distracted by who I need to talk to next after this conversation, or I'll get distracted by what I need to work on next. Especially on Sundays after I preach, I'm already thinking about what I need to preach about Next, I get so distracted by what's coming next or even the potential of what's coming next. And the disciples found themselves in that position. Jesus was encouraging them, but all they could think about was what they thought was coming next. And Jesus tells them, it's not for you to know these times. Like, don't, don't be so preoccupied by what might be coming. Don't be so distracted by what you think is going to come next. Don't look into the future and prioritize those things above what is happening right here, right now in the present. It's not for you to know these times or dates that the Father has already set by his own authority. We have an elder in our church named Jeff. Jeff is in the back row. Jeff, I'm going to give you a shout-out today, okay? If you don't know Jeff, Jeff has been on our elder board for about a year and a half now. But even longer than that, he's been serving with me in youth ministry for about six years. Is that right, Jeff? About six years? Jeff has been mentoring young people for a long time. And I'm, I've, I've heard him say this on more than one occasion. And I don't know if this is original, but today you're getting a Jeff Goodell original. Jeff loves to say, wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are, says Jeff. It's an important lesson. And it's one that's really difficult 
to let sink into your life. It's the lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching to us. Don't get so caught up in the big picture that you ignore the needs of the present. Are you focused too much on what might happen tomorrow? If you're honest with yourself, do you disregard people in the moment for more pressing matters? Do you dislike where you are in the present and you're always thinking about where you hope you will be in the future? Wherever you go, there you are. Jesus gave us a mission, and it's up to us to be present for that mission. Open your Bibles again to Acts chapter 1. Keep it open. We're going to read these verses together. I'll read them out loud as you follow along, beginning in verse 10, if you're with me. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Okay, like this is all happening so fast in the book of Acts. But Jesus, they were on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit is coming. You'll be my witnesses. We haven't gotten there yet, but Jesus then starts ascending into the sky. It's crazy. If, if you read, like it blows your mind. Jesus just all of a sudden, he starts ascending into the sky. He's riding a cloud, and he disappears up into the big blue nothing. I've always imagined it like Field of Dreams. You know, like they walk into the cornfield and they just disappear into the Iowa corn. That's how I picture Jesus. He's riding a cloud and then all of a sudden he just fades away and he's gone up into the sky. You can imagine that might be a little traumatic for his best friends who are back down on the ground. Might be a little scary. They might be apprehensive, confused, maybe awestruck about what they just saw. And as they were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so after they closed their mouths and wiped off the drool from their face, they returned to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers as well. They all joined together constantly in prayer. What did they do after their leader disappeared into the sky? They got together and they prayed. And then when they said amen, they started another prayer. And when that prayer was over, they prayed again. They prayed continually. You see, if we're going to be people who live on mission, we need to be prayerful. You've got to pray if you're going to do this thing. Prayer is key in meeting the needs of others around you. A life lived focused inward and on ourselves, downward and on material things, is a self-defeating life. One Bible commentator puts it this way, it's like a black hole. The more you possess, the more you collapse under your own weight. But there is another way of life. A life that is lived upward to the glory of God and outward for the good of others. Lee Thomas is an author of a book named Praying Effectively for the Lost. In his book, it's filled with firsthand testimonies of people who experience life change because of prayer. Thomas says this, when we begin to pray for someone's salvation, God seems to draw a circle around that person, and then he gets inside of the circle with that person. At least that's what happened with Ricky Gresham. Ricky told his testimony in Thomas's book. Ricky says it like this. During the months of February and March of that year, I lived some of the darkest days and nights of my life. I didn't understand it at the time, but during those months, I was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
Ricky said, everywhere I went, people were talking to me about Jesus. E- even people that I had known for a lifetime, they began sharing their faith with me. I couldn't escape it. I could not get away from it. One time, I was in the truck with my best friend, and we were driving down the road. One of his friends waved at us, so we stopped and rolled down the window, and that guy started talking about Jesus to us. We sat in the truck for what felt like an hour, but when I looked at my watch, it had only been five minutes. I was self-employed. I was working in a machine shop, says Ricky. There was an older gentleman who would frequently stop by and talk with me from time to time. I was too proud to ask anyone that I knew about Jesus. And so finally, one day, I mustered up the courage to ask this older gentleman about the Bible. I wasn't ready for his answer, but thank goodness he was ready to give me an answer. He said, hang on just a minute. He went out to his truck and he got out his Bible. Man, it was big and it looked like it was 100 years old. And he walked over to me and started rifling through the pages and he was reading scripture after scripture. And I didn't understand most of what he was saying, but there was one phrase that stuck with me every day since. That man told me, you must be born again. It never left me, Ricky said. I didn't have a Bible, and I was too proud to ask for one, so at night, I would open up the encyclopedia and look at the word Christ. On that page, the encyclopedia showed a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross, and that image was burned into my brain. And every night for a week, I would sneak out of the bedroom and go find the encyclopedia and just look at that picture. I knew that some changes needed to happen, and so I I began to try and change things about my life. I, I used to not be able to control my tongue. Almost every other word out of my mouth was a cuss word. And I tried to stop, but it was like the words had a, a grip on my mouth. I, I couldn't get them out. I couldn't get rid of them. I, I kept failing over and over again to change my language, but I couldn't. And so one day, alone in the machine shop, I just spoke to God. I said, God, I need your help. I need you to help change me. I don't understand all of what Jesus did for me on that cross, but if you show me, I will follow you. And from that moment on, Ricky said, everything began to change in his life. Not only did he stop using curse words, he lost the desire to use curse words. It was as if he never knew the words to begin with. And as this life change began to happen in such a short period of time, he said he just had to tell somebody. And so he went to the pastor of the church that his wife always went to, And he said to the pastor, I just need to tell somebody what's been happening. And the pastor let him speak to the church. And Ricky didn't know what to say except that God had been working on his heart and that God had allowed him to know and love Jesus Christ and follow him for the rest of his life. After the fact, Ricky said, what I didn't know during those two months of conviction was that my wife and her pastor had committed themselves to pray every day for my salvation. What I was experiencing was God answering those prayers. Do you pray for the lost? Do you call them by name before your heavenly Father? Do you take time in your small group sessions to stop and pray for those who are lost within the circles who are represented in your group? Do you pray to God and say, God, give me your eyes, give me your ears to see and hear people the way that you see and hear them? They are like treasure, as we've already heard this morning. If we're going to be people who live on mission We have to be people 
who are prayerful for the lost. Your ability to pray for the one is not lost on deaf ears. Those prayers fall on the listening ears of your heavenly Father. If we go back two verses in our first chapter of Acts, we read the verse that has been our church motto for 20 20 years, almost 21 years. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, remember Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times that God has already set by his own authority, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Man, I love it. And to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Quite simply, if you're going to live on mission for Jesus, you need to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. I want to show you a picture of a friend of mine. His name is Chris Robinson. Chris, uh, Chris works for CentOS. CentOS is that company, like, when you come into church on Sunday mornings and, and you wipe your feet on the mats that are on the ground at the entrances of the church, you have Chris to thank for those mats, that they're clean every time you walk in and you have fresh place to wipe off your dirty shoes. That's thanks to Chris. Chris comes about once a month and he delivers the new mats for us. And about a year ago, Chris walked in on a Monday morning to give us the invoice for the month. And we were in the middle of our staff meeting. In the middle of business time, Chris walks in. And for some reason that day, we just asked Chris, hey, how can we pray for you? which is a little out of the ordinary, I'm ashamed to say. You would think that in a church office with ministerial staff, every new person we have interaction with, you would think it would always begin or end with, how can we pray for you? But the honest truth is that we get distracted, just like the rest of us, and we have too much business on our mind, or we're blinded by the peripheral things, and we fail to see who's in front of us, Or we're just oblivious to what's happening right here, right now. But on this day, Chris was there, and somebody in the room had the idea, how can we pray for you? Well, Chris was gracious, and he gave us something to pray for. He said, pray for my marriage. He let us in on the knowledge that he and his wife were visiting a counselor. And and in Chris's words, My wife and I, we just want to honor God. So we prayed for him that day. He got back in his van and went on to the next delivery for another client. Well, the next month, Chris showed up, staff meeting day again, comes in to deliver the invoice, and so we prayed again. And and for months, this happened, and we learned more and more news, and eventually the news got good. And one day he comes in, he says, my wife and I are doing great And the counseling is so good for us. We're so thankful to this little group of people in the office for praying for us. Chris said, I love that one Monday a month when I get to come deliver mats to this church. In April of this year, Chris Chris stopped in. But it was an unusual Monday because I was alone in the office. I don't know why. I can't remember for some reason or another. Everybody else was gone except for me. And I was thinking, all right, I can actually get some work done today. (laughs) We don't have our morning meeting, so I can go and do some things that I don't normally get to do. I've got a few things on my agenda, and I want to get a jump on this work week. And then in walks Chris. You see, in my mind, I had plans for my calendar that day, but God had planned my schedule differently. And truthfully, I didn't want to stop and talk with Chris that morning. Uh, We we shook hands and said hello to one another. And in my mind, I was still walking to my office to do work. But Chris leaned in for a moment, and we just started talking about Jesus. And Chris shared more about his life and some of the struggles he'd been through and some of the unforced hardships that he had put himself through. And that now... In his current state, he was on a path of discovery in his faith in Jesus Christ. And a few minutes in, he said, man, can I ask you a question? I said, I don't know. Are you sure you want to ask me a question? He said, can you tell me more about baptism? 
in my mind, I thought, okay, here we go, because I'm a Bible nerd, and so we started all the way back in Genesis, right? And we worked all the way through to the book of Acts, and then we went to Romans, and then back to the book of Acts, and it felt like an hour, but really it had been about five minutes. And don't you know, the Holy Spirit had already been working on Chris's heart before he even walked in the door of our church that Monday morning. And within five minutes, Chris looked at me and said, man, I have got to do this thing. And so we walked over here to the worship center. And Chris changed into his set-free T-shirt. The video kind of jumped a little bit there, but he confessed his faith in Jesus Christ. And we baptized him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Chris got out of the tub, which was quite cold that morning, changed his clothes back into his work uniform, got back in his van, and went on down to the next client to deliver the next set of rugs. Two weeks later, Chris called, excuse me, two months later, Chris calls me on the phone. Kind of random. He lives up in Austell, so he can't make it for church here, but He's going somewhere else, and I'm proud of him for that. He called me out of nowhere, and I answered the phone and said, hey, Chris, what's going on, man? He goes, hey, man, I'm down here at Bojangles on the other side of the bridge, you know, down towards the horse park. I'm delivering some mats for this guy, and I'm talking to the store manager, and we're talking about Jesus. He just told me he's a Muslim, but he's really interested in learning more about what it means to follow Jesus. Can I give him your number? And I laughed. <laughs> I said, Chris... You don't need my number, man. You've got everything you need already inside of you. Now, I'm still waiting to hear the end of the story between he and his store manager friend at the Bojangles, but I know this, that Chris is prepared. He is ready because he knows what Jesus has done for him, and he is so amped and ready to share with others what Jesus could do for them. You are are a witness. You are. Those who are in Christ, you're a witness. And being a witness means being ready at all times to give an account of who Jesus is. The word witness in Acts 1.8 really comes with action applied to it. It's an action word. It has this feeling of, it has this feeling of like, if you don't share what you have seen, then what good are you? If you have seen something great, but you fail to share that message with somebody else, what good are you? It's like on Sunday mornings. When I come in, I go upstairs and get to hang out with my buddies up there. Jeff is up there and Cal is up there. They're the sound and the computer people most often. And, and we come up and the three of us, we love chatting about the Braves. Jennifer's up there today too. She loves chatting about the Braves too. We catch up on the Atlanta Braves. Imagine this. That I walk up on a Sunday morning and Cal, just imagine, Cal comes to me and says, Hey, Curtis, did you see that life-changing play that happened last night? Well, what happens if I say no? If I say, no, Cal, I didn't see that. I'll tell you what Cal would do. Cal will describe in great detail, won't you, Cal, exactly what happened the night before. Because Cal wants me to appreciate what he appreciated so much the night before. He saw it happen, and he wants me to know about it. That's what being a witness is all about. Not just that you saw an event or you experienced an event, but that you would then take it and share it with someone else. And you have to be ready. Because you never know when you might find yourself face-to-face -face with a person who is ready to hear about the news of Jesus. What would prevent you from being that type of witness? Is it shyness? You don't want to break out of your shell? Is it a fear of rejection? You just can't take it when people dislike you. Is it feelings of inadequacy? that You don't know enough, or maybe you feel like you don't have enough biblical knowledge, or maybe it could be, that you just don't love people enough to care about their eternity. You are a witness. 
You're a witness because of what Jesus has done for you. Jesus, who lived the perfect life, he went to the cross, even though he didn't deserve that punishment. And he gave his life for you. He was rejected and beaten and killed. He received what you deserved. He was crucified on the cross, hung up and died on that hill at Golgotha. He was buried in the tomb, but after three days, he was resurrected from the grave. Jesus is your Savior. And we will worship him this morning. We will worship him as the Lord and Savior, the one who deserves our worship. We'll worship him with our voices in just a moment when we stand and sing to him. But maybe, maybe instead of singing, you need to cry out to Jesus this morning. If you desire to make Jesus the king of your life, then as we sing as a church family, Won't you move towards Jesus by simply coming out of your seat and meeting us in our prayer room in the back corner of the worship center? Our elders will be in there. And if you go in there and pray, this is what we'll do together. We will pray. We will ask for forgiveness. And together, we will move closer to Jesus this morning. Don't hesitate anymore. Lord Jesus, thank you call to salvation. It is a free gift of grace that none of us deserve, but we receive only through you and your great sacrifice. Lord, I pray for conviction. I pray for the one who has been prayed over so many times before this morning that right now they would heed your conviction in their life. Give it up so that they can have it all in your name, Jesus. We love you, Father. Love you, Jesus. We pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and worship our great God.